And we are now officially live. All right. Um, and, uh, you know, you try to get some, uh, some 19th century cinephiles to do 21st century technology, it doesn't always work uh, the way you wanted it to. But here we are. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so we'll we'll make sure that uh, that everybody has a chance to migrate over to this new page. I'm not entirely sure why the uh, the original link didn't work, but uh, hopefully some people. We've already got 11 people on right now, and hopefully more people are um, are coming in by the minute. Um, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna sneak away into the background here. I'm Andrew Sherburn from the film team, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go make sure that all the tech is indeed working, and I'll let you all uh, do a little talking for now. Oh, Rena, do uh, you want to introduce yourself? Certainly. My name is Rena Keen. I'm one of the board members of the Niles SNA Silent Film Museum. And a couple of years ago, I uh, went to Marin and saw a documentary film festival. And Mr. Zaz was there and John Richard was there. And I saw the film and was just so enamored by it that I became a huge fan. And when I realized that we had an opportunity to do an online presence this year with the Niles SNA Silent Film Museum's 23rd annual Bronco Billy Silent Film Festival, I was really excited about that. Then I found out it was actually the same exact weekend that normally Mr. Zaz here does his own Brinton Film Festival. So the idea that we could have a meeting of the minds and the screens and everything was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, and like Andrew said, I'm John Richard, one of the filmmakers, along with Tom Haynes of uh, Saving Britain, that I think some of the people uh, might have seen earlier in the week as part of uh, the film festival. Um, we're super excited about collaborating and gaining, you know, a bigger audience for what has been a, a, a long-standing tradition in Ainsworth, Iowa, but, um, you know, has never really been seen out, outside of there. Um, Andrew and Tom and I met Mike almost five years ago and filmed him for three and change um, as part of Saving Britain. And um, one of the most magical times every year really was going to this film festival at the Ainsworth Opera House and uh, having the lights, you know, turned off when the sun had gone down um, and just hearing Mike, you know, give his narration to these, to these films. And there was something magical that, um, you know, for me at least, whether or not it was historical that, um, you know, oftentimes music would have been shown with films, but also narration. But I think the narration is under under uh, represented, and and Mike's kind of I think in many ways um, part of a tradition of of storytelling with these films that's um, largely forgotten. He's also I think just a unique person in the world, and um, you know has really done an incredible amount of work with these films to teach people about the early movie history of Iowa. And uh, and about about this part of the country. So um, I guess I'll just turn it over to Mike if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about the uh, history of the festival. Well, hello, welcome everybody. <clears throat> I'm Michael Zoss. I'm from the Ainsworth Haskins area of Southeast Iowa. This is our 24th annual film festival. It is the longest running film festival in Iowa, and I think. It is one of the smallest towns probably in the country to have a continuous film festival. We have about 500 people and we show the films in our opera house and what makes that special is that Frank and Indiana Brinton that the films originally were from also showed in Ainsworth and Haskins as well. So it's kind of doing recreating history where it was originally created. And this is always one of my favorite programs of the year. I do many, many programs, and this is always one of my and the most scary because I don't normally plug in anything when I do a program. And here we're plugging in things and sending things in the air, and, and I'm just glad I'm not responsible for any of it. But normally we have um, two nights. We eat. Uh, locally made ice cream, and we watch uh, Brenton Films. Uh, I try to do a different program every year. The Brenton Film Collection has four to five hours of films, and we put them together differently, and we don't show the same films uh, year after year. We do different things. 
and last year we tried to show films that were older than the Brinton films and we showed a film from the 1870s. But this year all of the films that you'll be seeing are from the Brinton collection. Frank and Indiana Brinton were traveling entertainers from Texas to Minnesota and they were the premier movie projectionists. Uh, they were showing uh, moving pictures in 1896. And some of these films go back to that period of time. They're some of the oldest in the world. Some of the films that you'll see in the Ainsworth Opera House 24th projection tonight, some of those films, are the only copy to exist that we know of in the world is part of the Britain collection. So that makes them special. And we've always had people say, and this happened in Iowa. And we say, of course it happened in Iowa. We're the most entertaining state in the union. And so we're the best audience. And if you have a good audience, you have good performances. And so the Brenton um, duo were, were great to present to people uh, a form of entertainment that was new all over the world, but it was something that they mastered here in Iowa. So, Will, um, sorry about the ice cream. We, um, I'll eat some later, but uh, I can't share that with you, but uh, we will, uh, Start with films, I'll narrate them. And the very first time that moving pictures were shown, they were accompanied by music. Silent films were never silent. They either were accompanied by music and or narration. And so we'll do the narration tonight. So welcome to the 24th annual Ainsworth um, Film Festival. And it's showing only films older than 1908. The Brenton um, collection has uh, about 140 films and the most recent is 1908. So these are all 1908 or earlier film. Now we'll uh, open up for questions or comments and uh, we will try to do our best to answer any queries that you have. Normally, there's a lot more applause right there, Mike. Sorry. Uh, yeah. There's 100 people watching. Actually, you can't hear their applause. It's a technological a, a fault of the <laughs> technology. I almost wore my shirt like that, <laughs> John. It's always fun to see Mike with Mike. I, I don't have Mike. Well, uh, that was fun. I haven't seen that in a while. Um, John, you're still you're still muted. If you want to, oh, jump. there we go. Yeah, I was just gonna say. Speaking of the shirt, Mike, uh, how does it how does it feel to see your face on uh, on shirts around town and sort of you know be a little higher profile than you were when we started this whole project? Uh, well, it's it. I actually wore my shirt last night. Uh, we were <laughs> with some friends, and I had my shirt on last night. So. Well, uh, we let everybody know that if they if they want to ask you a question, um, they can do that, and and we'll be taking giving you passing on some questions from uh, from Facebook. Um, and then I was also going to just uh, let everybody know that tonight's uh, screening. Well, normally the Britain Silent Film Festival is held at the Ainsworth Opera House for for twenty three years it has been, but tonight we're not there. Uh, but we will be taking donations um, for the Opera House. So if anyone wants to make a donation, I put a link in the film scene chat, but I'll just say it here. Uh, you can send a PayPal, uh, any amount that you think is, is great, five bucks, 5,000 bucks, whatever it is, uh, to barnowlpictures at gmail.com. Um, and we will pass 100% of that on to the Ainsworth Opera House. So um, with that, uh, and it would be greatly appreciated because it's so difficult, as everybody knows, in the entertainment industry during the, the shutdown. Uh, we've been unable to have um, our events. This is one of our big uh, fundraisers of the year. We have it on the last Friday and Saturday of uh, July every year. Two years ago, we had a lot of people come out from Chicago, actually more Chicago people than local. 
Last year we had a couple that drove from Texas up to the Opera House just for the festival. And I think there may be a night because they contacted us that they knew that we were going to be. So it, people have been very supportive and we're very, very thankful for that. Um, well, John, you're kind of monitoring some of the, the, the questions. I do have, uh, I got one question here um, that, uh, that came in over Film Scene's uh, feed here. And uh, Elizabeth Collins wants to know, Mike, uh, hope, hope, first of all, hope that you're doing well, she says, but she wants to know what's next for you and the films. Well, <laughs> it'd be best to ask that later. Uh, we hope to recover and um, go back to the Opera House with films. And I've had a, a number of programs. I think now it's something like 40 programs that were scheduled for this year that have been canceled. And so when things are, are different, we'll go back to, to showing them. And um, it, it's great fun. People enjoy it a lot. And what's the most fun, and we've done this with Saving Brinton, we've been able to show that film where the Brintons originally showed the films. And uh, do that occasionally with the films to go to the very same building where the films were shown 120 years ago. And that, that's fun. And Elizabeth Collins is uh, doing her doctoral research on Franklin, Indiana Brinton. And her mother and grandmother were some of my students. That's great. Um, Rena, do you, do you uh, have any questions from uh, your festival? Why, well, yes, I do. Uh, let me get back on here. Hi. Um, yes, we do. We have, um, well, first of all, I did want to mention that it's really fun for us to see the Teddy Roosevelt Parade, as well as uh, the mention about Market Street because of the discovery of David Keene, my husband had figured out about the trip down Market Street film. So the Niles folks around here are all connected, of course, not just the location of San Francisco, but also the whole the fact that the Miles brothers were the ones that filmed the Teddy Roosevelt parade, the same folks who tri uh, filmed the trip down Market Street film. Um, so one of the questions we have is, please tell us about all of you, uh, the festival experience, how many festivals you went to, all the crazy places you went to, any, any special memories that came up because the idea that you've been to a hundred festivals on five continents is just absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, I think I, Mike can speak to the number. I think it's over, yeah, 130 times you, you've seen it in public, Mike. Uh, 124, I think, <laughs> hundred um, around that. Yeah, around 130. And um, March, we showed it in, uh, at the University of Addis Ababa in Ethiopia to a standing room audience there. And um, it's, it's just been great that it's been so well received. And I didn't know about in Ethiopia, but they, they, it was a lot of people in the audience that were filmmakers and they were very interested in it. And I've had emails from them and, uh, it, it seems to be a film that uh, it, it just really works for a lot of people. Uh, we still haven't shown it in Antarctica or Australia. So if anybody has connections there, uh, we would like to do it in Antarctica and Australia. Um, there's another, uh, yeah. John, did you have some more to add to that? I've got a few more questions whenever. Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Andrew. Um, there was a question, uh, let's see, um, wondering just what we knew about the, the Brooklyn B Bridge film um, and, and how it was cranked. Um, that, was, that was one of the questions. And then another about uh, where the kidnapping movie was filmed. And... Um, whether uh, Seven Chances perhaps was inspired by the chase or was that an old trope? Uh, I don't know the answer to the last one. Um, I guess I, uh, the one thing I can say is uh, regarding the, the Coney Island film, um, 
it was thought that that might have been shot um, on a larger format. Um, and that one of the reasons that it uh, was kind of thought lost to time, um, there are a lot of similar films, but this one, um, we've not found a, 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 an identical copy of this, of this version of the Brooklyn Bridge, Coney Island film anywhere else in the world. And uh, it was thought that it might've been shot on a larger format and that, that larger format uh, was then copied down to, to 35 millimeter and um, and somehow Britain had uh, what became the only surviving copy of that that film. And by showing the Market Street film in San Francisco, it was fun to show the Brooklyn Bridge film in New York. And Time Magazine made a big deal about it, put it on their, the film on their website when we were showing it in New York. Yeah, uh, to, and to address the part of the question about the, it being the trope, I didn't quite catch the question, but um, I think in many ways, these films were fascinating because it was the first time that people were experimenting with the form. You were trying to, some people were trying to do, you know, recreate things that were done on stage, but in front of a camera and other people were sort of, you know, imagining what can we do if we move the camera? What kind of things look interesting in motion? Um, just figuring out what you couldn't do on stage and what you couldn't do in a photograph. Um, the silent films really just experimented with those things in a really creative way. And I think the, um, yeah, that, the Lost Child is, is one of those. Although I think there were a lot of chase films at that time. And I'm not and, sure. And that, and that seems to be what people associate with that time is a lot of chases. And there mm -hmm. are some in the Brenton collection, but uh, certainly not all uh, have not seen any of the other forms of that film but almost every uh, production house did something with that storyline. And um, there's, a, there's another question, um, film related, uh, collection related. Um, Bruce wants to know if there are more fictional films or actualities in the collection. And I would have to do some, some <laughs> to that question, but. We I think it's about, we, we haven't categorized them like that, but yeah, um, yeah. I think I mean I think there's a lot of actualities. Um, you know, there's of course you know some Niagara Falls films and uh, some other kind of scenics. Um, there's some train films. Um, there's an amazing collection of films from um, about to be somewhere. Well, it, it was somewhere in the Middle East. I can't remember exactly where. Is it? Is it in the Holy Land? Yeah, in the Holy Land and and Egypt. We have probably the oldest film from Egypt and several other places in the Middle East, but Frank was uh, drawn to the Middle East and did lots and lots of things there. Uh, in the collection also, there's one animated film, uh, very short. Um, so there was animation from, from the very beginning, uh, a film that we didn't show tonight that is kind of significant is a, a newsreel film. And um, it was the uh, cyclone or hurricane, I think they called it a lot of different things, that hit, hit Galveston, Texas um, in 1900. And thousands of people died. And this was footage of that um, event. And you see armed guards because uh, the mayor of Galveston ordered anybody photographing or filming to be shot because there's no record of it. I think there's a hurricane in that area right now uh, named after our daughter uh, in that part of Texas today, I think even right now. But um, newsreel was something that was, was new and um, they would have been something that people wouldn't have kept they would have been out of date real quickly. But uh, the Britons did not uh, throw away things. They, they had kept their films and they kept the catalogs that they were ordered from. And the catalogs are, are very special. We have two George Melee's catalogs in English that as far as known are the only two copies um, in the world. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it is pretty split though. I mean, between kind of uh, you know uh, narrative films and actualities, um, a little bit of a little bit of everything in the collection. 
um, including that one animated film, which is one of the one of the few that we have absolutely no clue uh, anything about it. So it's one of, one of those things we need to send off to mostly lost one of these days and, and or, or post, you know, see if anyone knows uh, can identify it. It's pretty unique. Um, let's see. Uh, see any other questions, John or Rita? Mitch over at the Brass Gear Society was wondering, Mike, uh, if there's any updates on some of the audio that was in the collection. I know there were um, some wax cylinders um, from the same period as the films that um, had not been listened to. Is, is there any update on that? Uh, no. And uh, the Library of Congress had said that they could uh, take the sound from the wax cylinders. Um, and I never wanted to put a needle on the wax cylinders to hear, hear them because I didn't know what <clears throat> wax cylinders do after 120 years. The Library of Congress said that they would extract the sound using a laser and that they could do that. And um, they suggested it, but we have not been successful in getting it done. And then with the current situation, uh, nothing's happening. But hopefully, Next year, we'll be able to play some of the audio of uh, things in the Brinton collection as well. And the one I always think that would be fun to do is when we were showing the film in England, it was right after uh, a royal wedding, and they were saying that they had uh, shown all the film that they had of the royals, the very early uh, film of the royals. And one of the things they showed was the funeral of Queen Victoria. And I said, well, do you have the audio of that? And they said, oh no, just the film survives. And I said, well, we, we have the audio of Queen Victoria's funeral. So we could recreate that at some time and hopefully we can get a good copy of that and they'll pay us to bring it over to England. But right now we have not heard anything more about the, uh, that process. So I know there's a lot of people that are uh, involved with Mostly Lost, uh, and perhaps you could mention what, what that is. And I'm curious about your reaction, because I know that um, uh, it was wonderful for to see Serge Bromberg on there on the, on the screen, because he's one of our, our heroes. Um, so I'm just curious if you have any information, any thoughts about Mostly Lost? Uh, we've been there twice. Uh, John and I were there um, early on in the whole project, and that was where Serge Bromberg uh, identified the first George Melee's film, The Triple-Headed Lady, as the only copy in existence. And then <clears throat> we uh, were back, I think, two years later, and I did a presentation about the Brentons. Um, and it was coincided with the premiere of the film in Washington, D.C., so we made a trip out and did the talk at Mostly Lost and then back for the um, premiere in Washington, D.C. Um, but uh, we still occasionally hear from Mr. Bromberg and we're hoping sometime that we can show the, the film at Mostly Lost uh, and maybe find out more information about some of our films. Uh, you know, where was the pig film filmed? Why was it filmed? Who was the audience of watching pigs? I don't think people in Iowa would have paid money to watch pigs because they would have watched them at home. But, you know, why was that film? Uh, and a question that I've asked people and at Mostly Lost, the films that we have, do they survive because they were the popular films? Or do they survive because they weren't popular and weren't shown? And the person I was talking to says, well, they never thought of that. You know, if they were a real popular film, maybe they wore out. And maybe that's why the pig one survived because it had no audience in Iowa. I don't know. So we hope to keep working with Mostly Lost and doing the, the audio things would just be fantastic. And, and I should, we should say that, uh, you know, there, there have been a number of films that have been identified um, by, the, uh, by the audience at Mostly Lost. Um, and I don't have a list of those in front of me at the moment, but um, 
I'd say, I don't know, it's so, so, somewhere six, six or eight films that, um, whether it's, you know, just by glimpsing um, some of the stills or by being shown at Mostly Lost, uh, we figured out, you know, what they're, um, you know, where they came from and, and figured out some of the details. So uh, I think there are still more mysteries, as Mike says. Um, there's a lot we don't know about the film still. Um, a lot of what we did know was discovered by referencing all the catalogs. Um, and, you know, thankfully, Mr. Britton had gone through and circled a lot of the films that he bought. So it was a little bit easier to kind of go through and say, oh, okay, well, this one must be in the collection somewhere and you match them up. Some of them, it's just reading the descriptions, you know, you read every description in the catalog and some of them say, oh yeah, we know we, we have that film. So. Well, and the people that used to write the catalog descriptions now write for real estate companies <laughs> and there isn't always a, a close connection between what is written and what is actual. But uh, when John and I were out there the first time, uh, they were showing some of the Brinton films. And when they showed one of them, um, uh, I read the description of the film from the catalog. And somebody in the audience says, well, where'd you get that information? And I said, well, from the catalog. And I thought that they would have the catalogs there and they didn't. And that's when we started finding that we have the only copies of a lot of these catalogs. The catalogs would come out, I think every, it depends on the um, production company, but a lot of times every three months, well, the old catalog, most people threw away and the Britons didn't. So uh, yeah. that makes them very significant. So I'm, we're curious about where those catalogs are and do we have copies of them or access to scans of those catalogs? Um, the Malay's catalogs, I think, are scanned and available on the University of Iowa Special Collections website. Yep. Um, many of the other catalogs right now, well, they've all been given to the University of Iowa Special Collections. I borrowed some of them back for a program that got canceled, and the library's been closed, so a lot of the catalogs are on our dining room table right now. Um, so I can go get them and read them to you if you want, but uh, they will go back to the university. And the goal eventually is for them all to be available online. Uh, well, the nice thing is there's a lot of digitizing that's going on nowadays. Yeah. Uh, we, should, we should say, uh, you know, if you, the film, the documentary's website, uh, savingbritain.com, if you go there, there's a link to um, the Britain Collection um right up there on the top menu bar um and so you can you can go over and that's hosted by the university of iowa and they've digitized uh, as mike said some um some catalogs as well as some of the films are available to watch there um and there's a gallery of um some other photos uh related to the britain um some magic lanterns things like that so uh that's a fun way uh to learn a little bit more about the britons I, they also have an interactive map you can, um, you can trace the Britain's path over many years um, through wow. the middle of the country, um, you know, just one, one stop at a time, stop by stop. Um, and you can see how they went all the way up to north, up north to Minnesota and all the way down to Texas. Um, and really, you know, took these shows, if you have great, great grandparents that, that were in the Midwest, they may have seen these films. So um, yeah, go check out the, the website. Yeah, that's the stuff that our people like to hear about, all the little details. Um, so I did want to put in a plug, uh, and I love PBS, but I, if you saw, if any of you folks saw the film on PBS, go and watch it on Amazon Prime or go and rent it on Vimeo, watch the whole thing, because it, you've got to see the tractor parade. You've got to see the other slices of life of Iowa. Uh, that whole film, the 90 minutes, every minute of it is worth is worth watching and it's um it just really resonates with me so i really i want to implore with everybody to see the film in its entirety if you think you saw it on pbs yeah didn't my wife just brought me one of the catalogs so here's a lubin catalog That's something lovely. about the um the brentons and uh their route from Texas to Minnesota. 
in the collection is also a letter from a man in California, and I need to look up the name. And he, in 1905, wanted the Brentons to bring their show out to California and um, was going to make it quite lucrative for Mr. Brenton. But Mr. Brenton could get a thousand people to one of his shows in a town with a population of 20. He had uh, developed tremendous audience draw. And so he never went to California. Why? He had a, a built in audience here in Iowa. And in 1905, Iowa had more people than California. So he could be here than on the coast. Let's see, do we have any other, any questions that have come in from, from the folks out there? Um, I think uh, I think that they're interested in knowing more about um, really just, uh, well, for me, it's the festival experience is really amazing. I know you went to Korea and you went to, you went to uh, Japan. And then, I mean, the fact that you went to Ethiopia and that was your last stop before the plane stopped running, um, I just, I, I'm just trying to figure out what it was like for the audience. I understand about the filmmakers, certainly that would be of interest. I'm just, I'm just trying to just fathom what it was like for these folks who English is not their first language and they're watching your film. And what, was there anything specifically they said about the film that you think that is uh, worthy of, you know, just repeating that you thought that, that would, would be, that would make sense from where they were living. If that, if that um, they asked a lot of very technical questions at the University of Addis Ababa. Uh, questions about the cameras that were used and, and things that I really couldn't answer. <clears throat> but they <clears throat> were very interested. Um, and we had a lot of questions. Um, we showed some of the, um, well, we showed the documentary, we showed some of the old films. And it, I would say the audience there was typical of audiences a lot of places and some of the same questions. When we were in South Korea, we were in the city of Jeonju, South Korea, and their language was uh, a big issue where it was not in Ethiopia because everybody there uh, spoke English well at the university. But we had to have a translation in, in South Korea. But they were very interested in the film and had good questions as well. Um, we've been in um, Netherlands. Um, uh, last fall, we were in um, Norway. And I always wanted to show the film in a tent because Frank often showed in a tent. And so the Norway Film Festival arranged to have the film shown in a tent. And then after the film, people went and dove into the fjord and had a sauna. Not all of us did that because it was cold, but we did get to show it in a tent. And, and that was, was just real great. We had wonderful response there. Um, and uh, England was good. Um, we've not been, it, not shown it in France and just the one film in Italy but uh, the world's been just really receptive. I think we've been in 24 states where at least one of us has been there with the film. Uh, it's been shown on every public television station in the nation. Uh, it, it has just been very well received. And uh, I was with some of my former students last night and they were talking about it and what it meant to them. Um, and these were people I'd had as students 30 years ago, and it was fun to, for them to keep track of it. So, and as we've traveled all over the world, uh, many, many, many places, I've had former students in other countries as well. Uh, not in South Korea, but uh, many places we've had uh, former students, and, and it, it's a community film, and I've had people from Kansas and Indiana and Nebraska say, you know, that could be filmed in our town. And that's good. That's good filmmaking when a film that is so heavily Iowa resonates as being a home film 
two other places. And the film guys did a wonderful, wonderful job. It's, it's been really fascinating to, to see the film around the world and, and how each audience has been has been different. You know, some are just dying with laughter, others are very serious and in tears. And it's not always the same audience in the same screening. Um, you know, we went from getting the audience in San Francisco broke out in in, in clapping several times during the film, and then in in South Korea where we flew a couple of days later, um, you know, it was a very quiet and respectful audience and, and engaged, um, but it was it was almost silent. Um, afterwards, some some folks who were, I guess, were from the university in, in Seoul came up to us and, and talked about the fact that they, most of the old films from their country were destroyed in the war, um, but th that some may remain um, in North Korea in the personal collection um, of the government of the of Kim Jong-un and that they we gave them our business card in case they wanted to uh, help make a film about the, or, or consult us on, on, on that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really incredible to see the different differences in audiences because each one um, is unique. I'll just mention something that I thought was fun. So here we were in Mill Valley, we were talking with you and I mentioned the Teddy Roosevelt film and, uh, and you said, oh yeah, well, we're staying near Market Street. We really want to figure out a way to, to, to read, you know, to walk the route, but we really don't quite know where they filmed that. And the Library of Congress just happens to have that film in their collection. And they have, much like the trip down Market Street film, they have it broken down street by street, blow by blow, exactly where to go. So I sent you that link and you got a chance to walk the route that Teddy Roosevelt walked in 1903. I believe that's what it was. So uh, that was that was a fun for me that I was able to help connect the dots with a local connection. Um, yeah, even, that, no matter that, how that was <laughs> that was wonderful because we weren't in San Francisco very long, but we made sure we had time to get down there and stand where that was filmed, yeah. and that was that was special. Yeah, when you read the films, it's just it's just amazing to me all this all these different interconnections. Another Bay Area connection, the, um, I was noticing Mike, Mike's got his Skywalker Sound shirt on tonight, and uh, that was kind of a fun, uh, the way that came about. Um, we, uh, we were filming here in Iowa City, and um, we got a call from, uh, contacted by, by someone who said, oh yeah, my, my brother's really interested in silent films, and he'd love to know more about um, this collection and uh, you know he works in sound and he's coming to town maybe you could meet with him and so we did and uh, that turned out to be Gary Rydstrom um, who is uh, you know works at Skywalker Sound and he's been there forever I think he's he's like the uh, the first employee ever at Skywalker Sound it might be an exaggeration but he's been there forever he's won seven Academy Awards and he just loved uh, he loved this collection so much we showed him spent a day with him just talking about early film and um, <clears throat> you know for a guy who deals with sound all day he, he sure knew a lot about silent uh, films but uh, when he left that day he said you know if you want to mix this film at Skywalker let me know and give me a call and uh, we didn't know exactly what that meant but we we gave him a call <laughs> a, a little bit later and and he made it he helped make it happen and uh, that was a real treat to go out there um, you know with some of the, the you know the most famous uh sound studios in in the world and um have this film um mixed out there that was a great experience as well and oh, if you so enjoy if you if you enjoyed the scene of mike uh, adjusting his tie in the bathroom in the bathroom before the uh the festival <laughs> in dubuque uh we were able to use that clip because uh gary was able to remove uh very precisely the music that was playing in the background of the uh bathroom brandon so, brandon yeah sure. oh brandon did that yeah 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 sorry but yes they had an amazing team. It was, it was marvelous to see what they could do. Well, I always say if somebody offers you something, take them up on it. Because <laughs> people don't offer things, you know, like, oh, sure, let's do this. Well, Wait, you might. They, they got us a good deal. <laughs> you might talk about your friend that filmed what was it run with the credits at the end of the movie, too. Oh uh, yeah, um, you know the some of the uh, the the slow mo stuff that we shot at the end was um, a collaboration with um, Scott Duncan, who's a cinematographer who was based here in Iowa for many many years. But 
you know, he's, he's uh, a big time kind of commercial photographer, but he also does nonfiction films. And, um, you know, you'll see his work. Uh, if we get to watch the Olympics next year, he usually does the uh, opening segments for the Olympics. And, you know, it's just some really amazing high gloss kind of stuff. But he had been fascinated by, by Mike in these films as well. And, we, you know, decided it would be fun to envision what, uh, you know, kind of take a poetic look at what this might be. And um, so we went outside and had Mike set up on the, on the lawn and shoot on the barn. And that was, that was a fun way to, uh, to just celebrate all of the different pieces of this, uh, of this story um, and, and see what it would look like as the, as the sun was setting. And it was, it was a beautiful night. It was fun. Um, before I forget, can we, can we ask the audience uh, if there are any former students of Mike's, because I think in it probably about 96% of uh, the showings that we've done, there's been at least, no matter where we go, there's been former students of, of Mike. He taught junior high for 39 years. Um, it'll take about a 15 second delay to Facebook, but uh, we'll, we'll see if, if we have any results. Well, Elizabeth had the first question, and so she's a former student, right? Oh, her mother her, is. Her mother is, okay. <laughs> That's right. <She's... laughs> and grandmother. Um, we're all students of Mike, though, at, at this point, right? <laughs> There's one. Troy Cleese, former student. Yep. <laughs> Des Moines, I think. There you go. That never fails. I mean, it was uh, fun. I, I remember, you know, even when we went to Europe, your students were sitting in the audience somehow. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> they're everywhere. Well, we had a, a former student um, in Ethiopia, but we knew that because we stayed with them <laughs> when we were there. But uh, he was a, a former student. His parents had been students as well. Wow. Liz Storm, who I think we met at the Anchorage um, oh. International Film Festival, um, she had a question about um, the kind of the Q and A the the because we we'd normally show the film and then we do a Q and A and and then show a smaller selection of the films like we did today but even smaller usually um, kind of asking about how do, how do you tailor it for different audiences maybe talk a little bit about how each audience do you pick different films do you talk about different things how do you how do you bring the story uh, to each event. Well, if there's any geographical connection, we certainly do that a little bit with age. Um, when we were in um, Texas, uh, we were concerned about age and whether what kind of films we should show because we had fifth graders, seniors, and graduate students. And we had some of the best questions from the fifth graders. So I think one of the things is that these films um, work for almost everybody. Uh, they're they're uh, entertaining, and uh, so we can pretty much pick the films, and it seems to work. Um, I don't know if you you have anything to add on that, but I think that um, you know we uh, the. We have the first films from Burma, the first films from the Middle East, and just the idea of showing them is, is exciting. And another thing that makes it easy is that most films are about a minute long, and so we don't bore people with them. But, uh, say that we've had, what? Oh, I was just going to say, for many years, you didn't have any choice uh, about the order of the films. I mean, that was right. when we first met you, uh, you know, you were showing films on 16 millimeter and it was just whatever order that those films were placed on that on that 16 millimeter reel by the person who copied them many many years ago uh, that was the order that the films were played in and that was one of my big big goals was to be able to show a film that i wanted to show when i wanted to show it instead of well it comes after this one it comes after this one <laughs> but now with you guys' help we can do that and um, so it's been a wonderful experience.
all well, now is the time for a shameless plug. I'd really like you to tell people how to get your the DVD and oh. any other swag or anything like that. This is sure. time because it's important for people to know what they're. We're not going to be showing the films, so you got to see the films. Uh, those films will not be on the um, rendition of this uh, Q and A when we put it on YouTube uh, in a short time. So enjoy, enjoy the fact you try to see those films, but they are on the DVD or at least some of them are. Yeah, there you can, you can get a DVD or a Blu-ray at savingbritain.com. You can also get, uh, you can also get a shirt with Mike's face on it. Uh, if you want one of those, there's a few of those left. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, each, both the DVD and the Blu-ray include uh, a second disc, which has, narrated films from Mike. There's a lot more even that you didn't see tonight. Um, there's over four hours of films in the Britain collection. Um, we don't have all of them on those the, that second disc, but there, there are hours, plural. Um, so if you want that, uh, we'd be happy to ship one out to you. Um, and, and then I guess one, one final plug for, uh, if you wanna make a donation to the Ainsworth Opera House, uh, you can PayPal barn owl pictures at gmail.com and uh, we'll pass all of those over to, to Ainsworth or you can do it the old-fashioned way and get a phone book and see what the address is for the Ainsworth Opera House and mail a check that's that's what Mike would probably do so yeah Ainsworth Opera House Ainsworth would probably get it <sighs> try it send cats yeah. see if it gets there <laughs> and and I'd love to see people who were part of this program tonight at the Opera House next year uh, I'll personally serve you ice cream. <laughs> Let's hope so. Well, thank you, everybody. I really yeah, appreciate thank it. You. Thank you for making this possible. This has been wonderful. Otherwise, we couldn't have had the film festival this year. And, and you just expanded it to the world from a town of 500. So uh, that that's very, very special. And the contact with former students and and San Francisco again, and yeah. well, and next next year will be twenty five, Mike. So uh, right, extra ice cream, <laughs> S silver ice cream, <laughs> lovely. There you go. Well, All right, you well, uh, yeah, I think uh, you know, we'll sign off. This uh, this stream will stay up on Facebook for a little bit um, for those people who maybe tuned in late, so they can watch the whole thing um and other but uh it won't be up there forever so watch it while you can great all right thanks everybody all right thanks everyone Good night. thank you